So again, welcome and thank you all for being here this afternoon. And as it was shared, I have um, been the chair of this core revision project for uh, three years now. It's been an exciting project uh, for NACOM and for me and the NACOM board. So uh, let me first start by sharing with you, you all heard Scott Griffith yesterday who had opened our conference by sharing the conference theme extending out from the core. And he asked by a raise of show of hands how many were familiar with the core. And we were very pleased to see that the majority of the folks raised their hand, that they were familiar with the core. And from there, he followed up with sharing with all of you that the conference sessions, they were going to focus on practical aspects, meaning practical application, that you could take what you learned in all of these sessions back to your home courts. So TJ, Janet, and I hope that you go through this session and think about this great resource that's available to you, how you could utilize that in your own home court, whether it be for yourself or for staff or colleagues. So we're very excited to share this information with you. So as far as how this afternoon will play out, I'll give you a brief overview of the core as well as the revision process and share the structure of the new core and then its resources. For those of you that might not be familiar with the core, you know that NACM has its core competencies that were the framework and foundation for programming since the early 90s. So there was a process of three years of reaching out to court professionals like yourself, court leaders, court administrators, subject matter experts, to review the existing core competencies to make recommendations for updates and revisions. It was a three year long process. So we have a great product available to you, all of you to utilize, and we'll be sharing that specifically in the reference to the curriculum that has been developed. When we talk about the curriculum, we'll talk about the design of that curriculum, the learning objectives that are there, as well as the components and the resources that are there for each of you as well. So just to start, this was the original wheel, as we called it, the core competencies. And we had 10 competencies, so those were the ones that were developed in the early 90s. And the original core, as I had mentioned, was the foundation for national and certification programming. I know some of you might have taken or are familiar with the National Center for State Courts Institute for Court Management Program. They have two levels, certified court manager, certified court executive, as well as a fellows program. But the CCM and CCE are based on those core competencies, as well as a Michigan State University program. They too have the non-credit bearing and the credit bearing certificate program that are based on NACOM's core competencies. We revised our competencies into the core and both ICM and MSU are updating their courses to reflect the changes and the updates to NACOM's core competencies. So as a point of reference, I did want to share with you the structure of the new core. There are three modules and they are entitled Principle, Practice, and Vision. And there are competencies tied to each of these, those three modules. The first one is the Principle module. And the competencies that are within that module are those that every individual that comes into the court to work need to know. Doesn't matter position or level. And those competencies are purposes and responsibilities of the courts and public trust and confidence. So just by the names and themselves, you can understand that it doesn't matter what position you're in, those individuals need to have the competency in that area to work in the court. The next is the practice module. And those competencies within that module are those that we perform either daily or long term in our day to day jobs from workforce management to ethics issues, operations management, case flow. And then the third of the three modules is the vision. And those are the strategic initiatives, long term sort of high level uh, activities or competencies and those include uh, court governance, leadership and strategic planning. So those are the competencies there. 
this graphical display shows those three modules and those competencies that are tied to each. The resources that are made available to you in the court start with the core website. The website is nakemcore.org. And when you go to nakemcore.org, this is the first page that you will see. And you can go right to the core, get to the modules or the competencies just by clicking on that core button. We also on the first page also highlight every so uh, every few months one of the competencies. This one is focusing on accountability and court performance. And then certainly we have information about the uh, about NACOM itself. Just to share with you, there are two websites, one for, for NACOM, NACOMCore.org, uh, uh, NACOMNet.org, which is the NACOM website, and then we have a core website, NACOMCore.org. So there are actually two websites. Additional resources that we made available to the courts start with the core guide. That was mailed out last year to all members, and it goes over the details of the core and how you would actually utilize that in your court. And what we'll be focusing on today is the curriculum. And again, as I had mentioned in the opening, we hope when you listen to TJ and Janet, we hope that you're thinking about how can I utilize this in, in my court? The curriculum is set up so that you can take it all, a portion of it. We as managers or leaders, it's very difficult many times to put training programs together. The material that has been developed in these competencies in the curriculum is rich with information that you can just pull and utilize yourselves to either conduct a class by yourself or a session or just have a discussion. I wanted to focus on the actual uh, writers of the curriculum. We have uh, Kevin Bowling, who's in the room, wrote the Public Trust and Confidence, and Jude Del Prior, the Purposes and Responsibilities of the Court. Then the curriculum writers for the practice include uh, Tom Dibble, uh, Lynn Malloy, Janet Cornell, who is here, Peter Kiefer, Sally Rankin, Don Palermo, Karen Thorson, and Mike Bradenbeck, and Angie Smith. But you can see that there are leading experts in the field of those particular competencies that helped write this curriculum. And on the vision module, we have TJ Bement, who is here, who wrote the leadership curriculum, and then Cyril Miller, Ken Pankey, and Ray Ballette, who um, Ray wrote the court governance. So we thank those individuals for dedicating their time to produce this great resource for you. So how would you use this? So first, just to identify the knowledge, skills, and, and abilities for those working in your court, and to educate the next generation of court leaders can be used for professional development, new staff orientation. Now in Virginia, we have all new employees in all courts, all the, the district courts as well as in the administrative office of the courts, they go through the purposes and responsibilities of the courts course. We think it's that important that they actually go through that. So you might want to think about that if you have an onboarding or an orientation program, you'd be able to use that information for new staff. And additional needs that were identified by the NACOM board was that this curriculum should focus on new and emerging trends, and it should include basic information for entry level staff, but also have uh, information for uh, leaders, high level theory for them, as well as detailed operational content as well. So this curriculum is very rich in detail. So, what will the curriculum look like? The design and format starts with an introduction. What is this competency? And then what are the, the learning objectives? What will I get from actually reading through this material, going through this material? How to use the curriculum? Uh, of course, the NACOM core reference, but then who the target audience is too. Many times you're wondering, is this appropriate for this level staff or this group of individuals? So each curriculum identifies who the target audience is going to be. Then we have the detailed educational content. We have great faculty resources that are available, keeping in mind, again, that this material is available for you to, 
to be faculty or have someone else be faculty to actually deliver this information. So we wanted to make sure you had resources available. Each of the curriculum has activities. As you know, when you go through these courses, you want to reinforce what was just shared and you want to know that people learn. There are special notes for faculty and certainly a bibliography of links to articles or reports that are important or in reference to the specific curriculum. So this is just a picture of the table of contents page from the ethics competency and you'll see they're all set up the same. We have the competency title and what module that is from and the detail in the table of contents. And then for each of the competencies, as I had mentioned, you'll have detailed faculty resources. You'll have activities for them to either you know, think of something, draw something, talk about something, and report out. And then as I had mentioned, the bibliography as well. So a lot of great information. They are all formatted the same way. Each of the 13 competencies have this resource information available within. So now I'm going to turn it over uh, to TJ and to Janet to actually talk about their specific curriculum that they wrote to engage you as far as how you might be able to utilize that back in your home court. So we'll go ahead and turn it over to Janet. Thank you, Paul. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the world of operations management. And I feel badly for the folks behind the pillar there. Um, welcome this afternoon. In one of the introductory slides, it said experts in the areas were used to write the curriculum. Well, I am in no way the expert on operations management. And when I received an email inviting my participation, frankly, my first instinct was to say, heck no, and to run, because I knew that the competency of operations management was a mixture of all kinds of competencies. But then I thought a little bit harder and chose this as an interesting challenge. In fact, in the operations management competency, it is a mix, as you will see, of near, if not, 17 different competencies. In the prior version of the NACOM core competencies, there was one called essential elements. Do any of you remember essential elements? Raise your hand if you do. I participated, as many of us did, many years ago in the creation of the core competencies, and essential elements was kind of the catch-all, were things that did not easily fit, for example, in case flow management or budget and fiscal management, went into this pot full of essential elements. Well, in the operations management version of this, it is the hope that it makes a little better sense as to what the various sub-competencies, or I believe in the actual document I titled it elements of operations management. I also want to start out by giving a shout out to those who might be watching this remotely or those who watch this after the fact our intent here really, really is to expose you to the wealth of information and tools that you can take and go right back and apply, either in whole or in part. I certainly invite you to ask questions, so if there's something I'm going over, uh, please raise your hand and let me know that you have a question. So let's take a look at operations management. Paul has already outlined for you that each one of the competencies is set up with the same structure, the same intro, the same elements within it, the same um, set or the same areas where resources and exercises are provided. Operations management is no different. Here's a slide that illustrates the prior version of this competency called essential components and the new version. In the earlier version called Essential Components, as I mentioned, it was kind of the big pot of stew of things that did not fit in the other main competencies. When it was all finalized, it had five key areas of competency. And in hindsight, I'm not sure that it worked, but we're here now, 
with the ability to have a new competency called operations management. Here are the five main functional areas that were included when essential elements or essential components was created. Case preparation, so things behind the scenes that helped prepare cases, adjudication of cases, which could include services needed to bring cases to adjudication, enforcement activities, court infrastructure, and program management or evaluation. Turning to today's version, operations management, as I began to put this together, I actually did a survey of probably 32 individuals who I did consider experts in the various operations management areas. And what I found out is some of the competencies of operations management may not fully be under court control. For example, probation may not officially be under court control. For example, court security. Also, information technology. Some of the elements that are in this competency may not, in all of our courts, be under the authority of a court. Also, there's quite a wide array of functions and responsibilities, and some of them are pretty intricate and complex and have significant problems if they go south, like indigent defense, like information technology. Uh, obviously, our courts, while we're all in courts, there are wide variations in how we operate. So as these elements pertain to you, you will need to look through the lens of how does this fit in how my court's organized and how our uh, laws and rules and orders govern how we operate. And then here's the last mention of some functions are indeed or may be outside the court's supervision. Here is a quick chart of all of the elements that fit within the current competency of operations management. When I started the writing for this, I spent many hours thinking, how on earth do I congeal this down to something that makes sense? And I ended up putting the, the elements into four categories. So at the top of each of this quadrant areas is the title of the category. On the upper left, I started with services required by constitution or federal regulations. And within this area, we have jury functions, indigent defense, perhaps foreign language assistance, and making the verbatim record. These are traditionally things that courts need to make sure are provided to the litigants and the court users. Upper right hand quadrant was titled programs and special services. And within this area, you can see probation, special court ordered services, alternative dispute resolution, problem solving, or specialty dockets. In each of these quadrants, when you see the asterisk, that means these are items potentially outside court responsibility, potentially. Some courts do all of these, but some courts may not adopt these responsibilities or may not be authorized. Lower left quadrant was titled Access and Direct Services. And within this area, we have court user services, access for those with disabilities, courtroom operations, records management, fines, fees, collection, and exhibits, and I'll pause here and say, each one of these items listed here in all these quadrants could be an entire course and content all itself. I think some of you would agree. For example, records management, fines and fees. They could be a course all themselves. Perhaps the next generation of the core will get to that level. On the lower right-hand side, this area is titled infrastructure and support. And these are items that are perhaps behind the scenes, the infrastructure let, that lets the court operate. Here we have IT, continuity of operations, or COOP, or disaster preparedness, facilities management, and court security. As you can see, there is just 
an infinite amount of potential knowledge people would need in all of these. There are 17 of these things here, all under the umbrella of operations management. As we get into the actual document for operations management, it's probably upwards of 120 pages long. This is a quick view of the table of contents. As Paul mentioned, it has introduction, who this is for, and then it organizes the various areas. There's an overview section, and then the content goes in each one of those quadrants. The content delves further into the elements that are part of each one of those competencies. Does that make sense so far? Right. Here are the learning objectives that pertain to operations management. And uh, disregard number four. Number four went down the floor after the editing process. It is no longer a learning objective. This was, as I say, a very interesting adventure. As we were authoring these segments, we were charged with make this practical, make it applicable, think about what the learning outcomes should be, make sure there's exercises. When all is said and done, I didn't have an exercise for number four. It went, by the way. <laughs> um, there are five learning objectives here, four if you delete number four, and then here's some more. There were a total of nine learning objectives. Our goals also were to make these action-oriented, things that people who went through this course would actually practice, gain some insights, learn content, and be able to go back and apply. You should see that in some of these titles. Identify something, evaluate something, assess, and number 10 up here, construct a personal action plan. Our assignment was to make these action-oriented learning points, not just think about it and ponder it. So hopefully, when you take these back and try them, you can validate for us that we did that. Because of the wide array of competencies in this particular operations management, I chose to embed this visual in the document. And under each one of those 17 areas, identify the content with an introduction. And so there's a graphic in there with an exclamation point. This area is intro for this topic. Identify the desired knowledge, skills, and abilities, or KSAs. And there's a graphic at that section that is keys. Here's the keys to this content and I chose to identify the challenges with the particular content. And for that, there was a beware, warning. So there are those visuals spread throughout this competency, mostly because of the wide breadth of things that had to be covered. As was already mentioned, the, the competency includes faculty resources, it includes activities, uh, slides that you can actually take and use and replicate. That was the intent for all of us in writing these competencies. A bibliography. And what you see on this chart is on the lower right hand corner, one of those slides that you could actually take back and use. And in the operations management competency, I also included a lengthy list of organizations, associations, and entities that have subject matter expertise. When I started this competency as part of my prep, I went, for example, to the American Bar Association. I went to the National Association of State Judicial Administrators. I went to various organizations, arbitration association, to kind of step up my knowledge of some of these areas. So links to those groups and organizations are included. I recall there's probably a whole page of these. That alone is a source of content and information for you. It's there. Here, for example, is one of the sub-elements within operations management. This is indigent defense. You'll see the keys symbol here. 
So here are some key competencies that are asserted for those who want to know and be able to manage indigent defense resources. Now again, this is one of the competencies that may not be under court supervision. But here's a listing of the desired KSAs. Understanding the role of public defense services, familiarity with policies in managing those services, even being able to um, do contracts and oversee such programs via a contract with the service providers. Oversight of the budget for defense attorney operations. Then on the lower right are some actual elements that could be within a contract for indigent defense services. This was taken directly from one of the courts in my state because they were soliciting for indigent defense services and it was a wonderful real-time listing of the things that should be in a contract. The mention of court rules, the type of cases that an indigent defense attorney might be assigned, criteria for conflicts of interest, details about caseload maximums and volumes. Some of these may look fairly elementary. But because this competency, in fact, could be used for those who are just coming on board in court employment, or those who have uh, perhaps landed responsibility for this type, of res this type of assignment, I thought they were important to include. Also, uh, fees and schedules that might be used, expectations for the lawyer's appearances in court cases. This gets down to some nitty gritty. But this is content that's in here under this element of indigent defense. Here's another element, operation of courtrooms. Now, I did not at all claim to be expert on this. So once again, I reached out to those colleagues of ours, and here's some material that was included here. This is another area that I think is very elementary. but. Think of our new employees who perhaps arrive and they have never set foot in a courtroom. So we have a picture of what a courtroom layout is like. Think about what is expected to occur in a courtroom. Here's a listing of courtroom protocol information. So this is included in this operations management competency. <laughs> There are a number of activities included in this competency. There are nine total. Here's just a brief listing. Most of the competencies start out uh, outside of operations management and in operations management with some kind of invite to attendees or students to do a little reflection on where's their knowledge and where's their skill and where do they think they need to improve upon it. So first up is learning needs. What are the learning needs of the participants? What is the relationship of operations management to due process? Remember in the grid where I had the elements categorized, there were several competencies that were related to due process and regulation and um, constitutional documents that require certain functions. So there's an exercise that invites folks to brainstorm about what is our responsibility related to access to justice and due process. There's one on creating a specialty court program. How might you go about creating a specialty court? There's one on considering a policy for self-represented litigant access because this competency also goes to continuity and disaster preparedness, there's an exercise on COOP, continuity of operations planning. And then there's a focus on performance metrics and measures related to how well are we doing the operations management part of our house. Let us then take a peek at one of these activities. This is the one on creating a policy for self-represented litigants. There is an actual set of instructions. There is a document you could take and use as an exercise. And here are the key points in it. First of all, what are the expectations and services and needs of the court's self-represented litigants? 
just for play here. What are some of your answers to that first question? What are the expectations of self-represented litigants? Anyone, what are their expectations? What might they expect when they come interact with our courts? Going to be treated with respect. Thank you. What else? Have some idea of what's going on. Going to have some idea, be able to understand what's going on. Yes. The next statement here is, OK, what is our purpose in having a policy for self-represented litigants? What might our answer be on this? We want to state how we're going to do this, why we have a policy. What would you answer? I would say we want to establish what our practices are going to be to inform the Constitution, the law, court rules, and general behavior of how we operate. Good. We want to state our practices and our expectations and how we are going to do these things. Yes. So this is an actual document you could take and use as an exercise, as a discussion uh, promoter with those who might attend a session on operations management. As I said, it's created as a standalone document. You could print it out. There's instructions. Here's another activity. This one is towards the end of the competency where the attendees are invited to think about the 17 different elements and to begin their own action planning. Of these elements, which ones do we think are most critical to <coughs> improve our performance, to enhance our skills? You could take it any number of ways. This is, I believe, this is the last activity, I believe, in the competency. And again, it has that chart with all of the elements arrayed in the four quadrants. There's instructions, there's this visual, and you can invite people to actually go through this process. Also included is a visual that looks like this. Because I felt compelled to say, operations management really does touch lots of other areas of the court. It touches case flow. It touches budget and fiscal. It has the potential to impact or be impacted by leadership and strategic planning and court governance. I created this visual that on the left-hand side calls out operations management, but then points that it also relates to the competencies under principle, under practice, and under vision. So the assertion here is that competency in operations management also impacts the other areas and is impacted by the other areas. And further, there's an assertion that it is critical to have knowledge, skills, and abilities in all these 17 operations management areas to be a good leader, to be a court manager, to be skilled at knowing your work outcomes. And there's even assertion and urging that we should have metrics on all of these. We should have ways to measure these. This then is the operations management competency. As I started at the beginning of my segment, it's the new version of the pot of stew with all kinds of sub-elements that are still critical to a court in operating professionally and as a high-performing court. Are there any questions at this point on this competency? Yes. Thank you for asking that. In the old essential elements or essential components, there may have seemed to be a focus on state level courts, state trial courts. As many of us began this adventure of authoring, we did talk about this needs to be large court, small court, municipal court, limited jurisdiction court, specialty court, probate court, juvenile court, mega court, urban court, rural court, 
in, even international. Now there, are, there is language in here that is very US based, but the desire was make this broad enough that it could be applicable, regardless of the case type, regardless of the court type, regardless of big, little, urban, or rural. Yes. Other questions at this point? The intent, again, was make this immediately usable. You could take the whole thing. You could take parts of it. You could take some of the exercises and use them for discussion exercises right now with your colleagues. You could take some of the content that's in the narrative and see how it fits for your organization. There are slides, there are actual graphics that you could take right away and use and embed. I know on the old competencies, I would frequently go there and steal content to put in presentations. If not visuals, I would steal narrative to give me ideas. So the intent with this was to make that available to you as well. Is there any feedback in terms of the, the content that is in this competency? Does anything strike you strange? Not that we're going to start rewriting immediately, but it is interesting. <laughs> I'm not starting immediately. Is there any feedback on what you see here as these sub-elements? Does anything surprise you? Well, good. I'm glad not. I certainly invite you to take a look at it. I am personally interested on in how this floats because, as I said, when I started this, my instinct was, heck no, I don't want to touch this thing. At the end of my work with it, I had a very reinforced uh, appreciation for how important all these things are, even how a courtroom is organized. So that is the operations management competency. And I will now turn it over to TJ, who will delve into the leadership competency. Thank you, Janet. Can everybody hear me OK? I'll try to make sure I pop over here to wave to the folks on the other side of the pillar. Um, leadership is a daunting topic. Um, I have to thank Paul and the others who originally assigned this to somebody else other than me. Um, but after that person uh, was unfortunately unable to, to fully participate in the process, I had to step in and pinch hit on this. So I can use that as a learning example for you all that leadership is something that everybody can do better at and that you can learn. Um, one of the, the takeaways I've got to tell, tell you is that during the editing process, all of these curriculum went through a lot of discussion. We were questioned about does this make sense? Like Janet mentioned, does this fit a small court? Does it fit a large court? Does it fit a federal court? Does it fit a tribal court? And the answer was we tried to adjust the curriculum to be as many things for as many people as possible because to be reflective of you all as the profession of court managers throughout the country. So leadership was one of those as well. So we wrangle with some of those big questions of are you born a leader or are you made a leader? Can you learn leadership can you even be trained to be a leader? Did we come up with the answers to these? No, because if we did, we'd be the Stephen Coveys of the world and the seven, hab you know, seven habits of effective people and out there selling this stuff and making a whole lot more than we would as, as government employees. But what we did do is try to distill all those different philosophies and theories, in this case about leadership, and digest them in a way that can be discussed so that as you all as professionals out there in the field using this through the curriculum can help find your own path. And what that path is might lead you to be a better leader, might lead you to just have certain skills that good leaders demonstrate, and might make you a more effective manager, but maybe falling short to be the leader that somebody is going to follow into battle, but somebody that would be a good manager in the process. So this is a little bit of a, a journey as this process uh, we'll discuss. So is the competency here the old one? Leadership. The new one? Leadership. We didn't change any letters. The, I, the dot above the I is still the same. However, 20 some years later after the original leadership, things have evolved a little bit in our profession. So some of the things that weren't like there before are now talking about shared leadership. 
uh, the concept that a good court manager works with their presiding judge or their administrative judge or their chief judge or some other person within the court system in a shared leadership capacity. So we talk about some of those, uh, some, some of those kind of concepts to show that the concept of, of leadership has evolved over time. Um, it's much like uh, Janet's, it's divided into a variety of different sections. We talk about an overview of leadership, some of the leadership structures and styles in the courts, the various theories and models behind leadership, and this is where I had to read every single one, of, not everyone, but certainly a good number of those books out there in that self-help section when you go into the bookstore. Those of you that have been there, those, those sections are shrinking, but there's plenty of them out there. What those roles actually look like in a court context, because not everything that fits the boardroom of IBM is going fit to the, fit the courthouse and what, what we do on a daily basis. A big discussion about shared leadership in that relationship that I mentioned. And then finally, kind of coming into your own and finding your own voice. Um, good practical example yesterday. Uh, when we had the speaker in the morning talking about coming in and shaking and putting your thumb right on in there and, and you know having that relationship just from the moment you walk in the door, the same kind of concepts fall into leadership. That you are you can be a leader in any situation that arises, but at the end of the day you've got to find your own voice. And part of it is with developing that emotional intelligence. Part of it is what we talk about in the curriculum of reading the room. When you are being a leader, you know who's in the room, what those different backgrounds and those different styles are so that you can pick up on that. Uh, same similar kind of context um, as uh, Janet mentioned here. All the curriculum are laid out the same so that if you start to look at these, you'll get the same look and feel so that you'll understand how to go through them. Um, ten learning objectives in leadership, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think the original list had like 16, and then through the, the editing process, we kind of combined a few and tweaked a few. The thinking being here, we erred a little bit towards a lot because leadership is a heavy, heavy topic. There's a reason it sort of sits on the top of the pyramid. It's something that everybody aspires to be in the court profession in some capacity or one other. So as we go through this, you'll see that some of them are more achievable. It's just about learning backgrounds and styles in leadership. And as you kind of go on down the list here, as you get to number 10, it's really developing that personal action plan, just like Aunt Janet mentioned, a personal action plan for operations management. But in this context, a personal action plan for you to develop your own style and your own voice as a leader. So each one of these has activities associated with it. And we'll go over one of them as an example. Uh, we have introductions, KSAs, and challenges. Those are presented throughout, much like Janet's. I, I'll say that we don't have the, the, the fun graphics throughout the, the leadership one. We might be able to go back and put those in um, so that you've got the references there, but the same kind of concept falls throughout. Um, one I do want to talk to for a moment, for those that might be familiar with the old leadership core curriculum, some of these are still the same. Some of them are a little bit different. We've taken each one of these and in the curriculum really further discussed them a little bit more in depth and they roll into some of the resources that are available and some of the activities that are available. Leaders are good innovators. Leaders are motivators. They're excellent communicators. They're collaborators. They're visionaries. They're strategists. And the last one that kind of came in through the editing process is that idea of a statesman. I used the word statesperson, but it didn't quite have the same kind of feel to it. But we wanted to be reflective, man or woman, no matter what it is. A good leader at the end of the day is the statesman of the court, at least from the management perspective, not to overshadow your judge or your presiding judge. But we are a statesman. If you think about the old statesman concept that you have throughout history and throughout diplomacy, that was the person you wanted to talk to. You had a problem. People couldn't get along. You went to the statesman. That was that learned leader that people looked to and respected. So kind of capsulating that, that concept here as we go into discussion about leadership. Uh, we had a variety of faculty resources here. Um, we sort of divide them up throughout different sections so that you knew which activities and resources kind of went along with the different discussion throughout the curriculum. Uh, similarly, we had a lot of activities here. I think this had about a dozen or so activities at the end of the, the curriculum guide. Uh, we're developing slides as well. We've got lots of graphics and stuff that are scattered throughout the curriculum that we're going to make available um, as 
has slides that are available to you. Some of them we actually had to go back to the publishers like the Stephen Coveys of the world and actually ask for permission to use these kind of things. So we're able to extend that to you for the educational purposes that you all would be using these for. Um, and most importantly, a very long bibliography so that there's links there when appropriate to these documents on the web and also as you see the discussions throughout the curriculum about certain leadership styles, models, traits, etc., you'll have that full bibliography reference just like Janet mentioned in hers as well so that you can go and find these things. And if you all decide to be faculty or work with faculty that are doing some of these activities, those you'll be able to go back to those individual references in those sections and know the page numbers and where things came from so that you might want to read some of those for some greater context. Um, lots of resources in here. We tried to put as many graphics because nobody wants to just talk about words. Words on paper get a little bit boring. So we wanted to make sure that these curriculum had some life to them. So in that process, lots of images that you can put on slides and use to generate some conversation when you're instructing or teaching this at the local level. Um, throughout a lot of the leadership, really tried to put a lot of side-by-side -side discussions. Um, one of the chapters in there is a discussion, for example, about management versus leadership. In most people's minds, when you start talking about them, they think they're the same thing. Or when we think they're not, we use some of the same words to describe management and leadership. So we have a lot of side-by-sides that take some examples and issues and breaks them out and say, well, it's really this thing in the management context, but if you're really thinking at it from a leadership perspective, it's really this kind of thing. So you'll see things like traits and particular skills, both of a manager as well as a leader. So it allows you to kind of do a self-assessment through discussions and activities about where you sort of fit on the range between just being a good manager and being a good leader. And you can be both, or you can be one or the other. Um, so again, some more resources there. Lots of pretty graphics that we got permission for. Um, one of the things, for example, when we talk about some of the models and traits of leadership, has anybody heard of the, the seven pillars of leadership? That's one of the, the theories that we discuss in there. Um, as we go through the curriculum, we talk in the very beginning about who's a great leader. And one of the activities says, okay, think about great people throughout history. Name one. Great leaders in history. George Washington. Abraham Lincoln. Martin Luther King. If you took another five minutes, you could talk about what made that person great, right? You'd be surprised as you go through that and just kind of putting it up on flip chart paper and stuff on the wall, you see some similar themes and traits and abilities sort of stuff emerge. And then as you go through the curriculum, as you progress and then put that in the context of what happens in the court, you see which of those traits are more appropriate in the court setting as well as those that are appropriate just within the context of leadership itself. Um, a variety of activities. We start out with a leadership self-assessment so that everybody can kind of put yourself on a continuum of what you already know and what you already feel yourself to be as a leader. And you can take that at the beginning of the process and maybe take it again later. Um, identifying leadership traits, talking about sort of great leaders throughout history. Uh, leadership styles and practice. Um, credibility and leadership. Powerful teams and things like that as we go through. Um, that leadership self-assessment uh, has all the instructions there. It's there. It's reprintable. You can use it locally. It tells you how to code it and add everything up and then gives you some discussion questions and everything to engage folks locally about after they've done one of those self-assessments. Um, this one that I had a lot of fun with. Um, is anybody familiar with the uh, poll that the National Center for State Courts has done for the last couple years? where they kind of get at what the public's faith is in the, the, the judicial system. A couple of y'all looked at that, and some of you probably didn't even know it existed. Well, there's a link there. Sort of, this, not the, sort of the, some of the state of the state courts, but they've done a poll through the media division. I can't remember exactly what the title is up there. Um, they did it, uh, the National Study of Confidence and Leadership. That was one done by the Harvard Kennedy School. And then the National Centers, it is the state of the state courts. So looking at those two things, the Harvard Kennedy, which is a similar type of national survey that talks about when people think about leaders in the government, what do we think? What are the skills that we think? Not the crooks and the cheats and the unethical ones. That's kind of there, but it's sort of the opposite of highly ethical, highly transparent, those types of folks. 
comparing that again with, say, for example, the poll that the National Center does that talks about what the public's trust and confidence is in the judicial system. And then the questions kind of take you through what do these things have in common? What is it that people are missing when they think about their interactions with the court? So it gets you to think about op everything from operations to planning to everything else and to then be able to be self-reflective about how can I as a leader within the court system demonstrate things that make sure that my behavior is ethical and transparent and builds confidence in my court system. So there's a lot of these sort of some high level, some low level discussions throughout the activities. Uh, much like Janet's, all of them are interrelated. Um, all the competencies sort of build off one another. Leadership is no different. Um, you can't really be a leader in the courts unless you have some working knowledge of all the other competencies. But sort of the point we make throughout the curriculum is as you're going through and identifying both your own self styles as well as the different roles that the leader exists in within the, the structure of the court system, that everything is interconnected. And as, we, as I mentioned earlier about going through and having that executive relationship with your presiding judge, there's also a lot of discussion about the interconnectedness now of the judicial system. You know, gone are the days where we could always say, we are the third branch, we are a full and mighty oak amongst ourselves compared to the other trees and branches that are out there. We realize that's not quite the case anymore. We sometimes refer to ourselves as the third twig instead of the third branch. We're all part, but we're all connected. So talking about that leadership in an interconnected, interdependent world, we, where we have programs like drug courts, which are so interrelated with the executive branch and working with treatment providers in the community and stuff, roles that 10, 15, 20 years ago, no one thought the courts were gonna be involved in. So existing in this new kind of concept within a leadership structure involves that we have to step outside of roles that are very non-traditional for, for leaders within the court system. So to acknowledge that and to be able to go and have some vision about where that is headed for the courts. Um, probably went through that pretty quickly, but want to just kind of talk to you a little bit more that as you all go through and look at these different curriculums and as you build up on them, we have them structured so that you can do them in brief little bits or longer. For example, uh, in leadership, we have it sort of set up that if you just didn't want to do a, a couple hour, you know, a, a part day sort of session, or all the way up to a three to five day training program, all the curriculum are based that way and they show you which <coughs> sections and chapters go with a shorter program or it could be in multiple short programs and what activities and resources so, go along with those. The idea being that you can create a training program wherever you are. Is it going to be as great as a college education at a Michigan State program or go into ICM for several weeks and do that? Perhaps not. The point being that you either on your own by going through these curriculum and working through the exercises at your own pace or going back and creating training programs, you're going to be able to further both yourself and those that you're working with down at the local level. So we, as we go into, and I'm sure we're going to have a little more conversation here, as we go forward with these curriculum, we want to be able to get feedback from the members here about which these things work and don't work. We don't want this to be a static document that is here and is in place and doesn't change for the next 20 years. We want to be able to evolve and, and tweak some of these, uh, both the curriculum as well as the activities and resources as the courts themselves evolve over time. So we want this to be a living, breathing process to get feedback from you all on. So we're here as an example. We want to open it up for you all to share with us how we can take this curriculum to the next level. What do we need to do as both NACOM as, and as also getting all the authors of the core together, what can we do to bring this to you all at the state level, the local level, through training programs? How do we make the core curriculum and the core itself relevant to you all? Question back there. Um, as Janet sort of mentioned, you go back to the very beginning, and I think I got it on here, go up to the principal module, and you've got the public trust and confidence and purposes and responsibilities. You've got to give all your staff a good grounding there. Um, 
you know, most of us probably don't have good onboarding, new employee orientations. We're really good about telling them how to do their job. We're not always good about telling them how their job matters and where they fit into the bigger context. So as we start that with the ground up with staff, then you might decide to say, I have certain staff that might benefit from operations management because they're within that structure. I might have others that want to go in and are HR people. They're going to look at educational development and workforce management and do some training there. I would always suggest the one that's new that we made a big effort on is ethics is an entire component unto itself. And I know in our state-based training, we're putting that in every conference, at least one ethics session, because we want to make sure that it's real, there's an expectation of accountability and transparency. So wherever it sort of fits with what you've got going on locally. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, if you have an issue or a situation at work, you know, talk about that and then look at the various components. Um, TJ touched on a great one, ethics, for example. I know that one court, uh, I think it was in California, they were having issues related to an ethics matter regarding acceptance of gifts. We all have that, right? Where you know the, they want to drop off a box of candy, attorney's office, and so forth. The beauty of um, that particular competency, we have videos in, that are available. Uh, one on that topic is called Gifts, Gifts, Gifts. It's you know, a five or 10 minute video, you show it, and if you have rules of conduct, for example, that you want to engage the employees in and what the rules and regulations, you show that video and then you talk about it. So again, those exercises are there, but starting with a specific topic or problem. And, and I would pose back to you, what is the area you think might be important? Maybe you take the overall listing of all the competencies in other words, the principal practice and, what's the last one, vision? Right. I should know this. <laughs> Take all you of them. You were in them. the practice sections, that's why. That's right, I, yeah. <laughs> that leadership stuff. Um, Take the full inventory of all of these and engage some kind of discussion with your staff or with your leadership team. We have these 13 big, broad areas. Where should we start? Uh, this is something where you can bite off little pieces and use it. You don't have to go back and roll out all 13 times 100 and some pages each. And as I mentioned, each one of those curricula, they have different sections about if you just want to do a few hour session, if you want to do a half day, a multi day, and it'll sell, tell you which sections and stuff you might want to cover as a suggestion. So you might, you know, poll your staff, talk about issues, and then say, I'm going to go do the one hour here from this and the one hour here and then over time or perhaps with your middle managers and upper managers sort of broaden out to some of the lengthier training. How else can we make it relevant? Kevin? I'm just curious if you could touch a little bit on whatever the current board's thinking is on um, updates. When, mm -hmm. when, when the original wheel And, and that's a very good question, Kevin. As I, as I had mentioned at the opening, you know, this was developed in you know the early '90s, and a lot of a lot has changed in 25 years. So there's a lot of work to do. But what the NACOM board has done to address just what you were saying is one: uh, they have formed a new committee called the Core. It, is a, it will be a separate standalone committee with members, if any of you are interested in joining, the new chair will be Kathy Griffin, who's at the back of the room. And, um, Kathy waved everybody. That's right. She has a sign-up sheet. No, uh, focusing on that, and we will have a subcommittee that will review the curriculum each and every year. When we design the website, when we, d when we set up the curriculum, we set it up for easy update. As you, we all know, we had uh, referenced the, the resources that are available. We all know that there are reports and surveys and other things that pop up every year. We want to make sure that we take those great resources, current resources, and include them in the curriculum. 
So the commitment to our members from the NACOM board is that we will have an annual review to update this material to include any type of new information, theories, resources, or so forth. So the, um, we're using some of the stuff at the local level and we find something works great and something let us know. Well, that would be helpful feedback. That would be great for feedback. Yes. And one thing I mentioned, uh, you know, Paul mentioned about the NACOMCore.org website. Go on there. There's a click to sign up for a newsletter. You're not going to be inundated. It's about once a month. It's once and a month. Generally going forward, hopefully it'll be about the same. So if there's updates, if we make a revision to one of the curriculum, or as our next round here, we're going in and posting, putting up some of the resources. We might create a library of images and additional slides and materials and stuff. As we post those kind of things, they're going to go out in that newsletter so that we're trying to keep it real for you. Another thing I know the conference development folks are always looking now that we have the new core, you know, obviously the theme of this conference, but making sure that it's always touching multiple elements of the core and that we're keeping that, that it's relevant. And my addition would be the curiosity of things you might come across that should be added to these. And my frame of reference, of course, is the operations management competency that there could be a, an additional 200 pages of content of good material, but in the interest of getting it put together, it may not have that now. Right. If you come across some things, my own interest would be some methodology to say, hey, here's a great resource on engine defense or on jury or on leadership things. And our educational partners, ICM, MSU, and some of the others, and all our state associations that are going to be picking up on this as well, they're going to be piggyback and adding to the content. So our thinking also is we can't cover every single one of these out there, but we want it to be living and breathing enough that each one of those groups that are using this as their core of their core presentations can then expand on it within the context of what happens in your state and structures that make sense for you all as well as at the national level, things that make sense generally for court managers to know. Any other questions or comments or suggestions? How can, how can you all take this back home and do it? Any thoughts? Yeah, we're curious There's how you were, you know, again, I, I had framed it at the beginning of the meeting just to be thinking about how you might utilize this great resource back in your offices, in your courts. Could anyone share any ideas as far as what they were thinking when both uh, TJ and Janet were sharing the details, what you might do with this great resource when you get back to your court? Yes. For, for me, it might be a measure as to um, confirm what we're doing operationally, say, what we're doing operationally versus what might be a best practice and use it as another tool to add to a, a number of tools to gauge whether we're doing the right things in the right places and, and gather some ideas and innovation and thinking um, differently about what we do because we're so ingrained in our current environment and entrenched in the way we've always done it to kind of give us some areas to explore being a little more creative or efficient or you know, various aspects of, of the thinking that we do. Great. That's a great Danielle. point. On uh, let me add one on thing onto that. Good point there. Not not all this means to be things that we have to have a session about. And you put people in a room in the train. Use the curriculum as just a self check, a reality check, for you know personal growth, whatever. So whatever way you want to use it. If you just want to use it in that context, that's great. We want it to be open. Danielle. Um, and I think that's how we might use it. Good point. Okay. The 
next question back. Yes. Ross. I was going to say the, at our board, we were just we had just finished developing a um, kind of a leadership curriculum that covered uh, you know, where everybody can't go to C and P, but we wanted a, a sort of a development uh, process for future leaders in our court, and we were kind of basing it off of the program uh, we've seen in D.C. and in Arizona. This looks like it's a complete curriculum that we could pretty much. You can take all of it. Yeah, and think of it that way. Uh, you know, take it all, just like uh, TJ and Janet were, were mentioning. And the beauty of the information that's provided, you know, you can augment it, add to it. You know, it, it's up to you because, as as Janet pointed out, some of these functions might not be court related. You know, you might not have a contract for indigent defense services, but but you might need to manage it. So you might want to add your own spin on uh, some of this material that's available. So don't think that you have to take it and follow it, you know, word for word. You can tailor it to some of these other things that you might have found or adapt it to your own work environment or to your need. Right, absolutely. As, you know, on Janet's example about the self-represented litigant developing a policy or protocol there, you could substitute anything in for self-represented mm -hmm. litigant and use that same format. It could be creating probation services. It could be a family help center. It could be whatever. So take this, take pieces, take all of it, you know, tweak it. You know, all we sort of suggest is stay true to the underlying core ish, you know, values and themes and stuff throughout so that you're making sure you're getting a consistent message across. Um, one of the other things sort of picking up on what Danielle and some of you have mentioned uh, with creating development programs, your HR managers might be interested in some of this to go through and look at those KSAs. If you have people that are responsible for operations, some of those things might start trending into your position descriptions and stuff as they evolve over time to really start meshing positions and things up with what folks are actually doing instead of the very generic ones that a lot of our courts have. And that prompts me to say, let's say you get a new chief judge or a new top administrator. This would be a wonderful set of materials to say, here are the mileposts that we consider important performance areas and skill areas for our organization. You could invite discussion around some of the content that's in here. You could make bits and pieces of this available for your leadership team to do your own self-assessment mm -hmm. on how are we doing on leadership versus management. Uh, if we're starting an endeavor on jury management, okay, what are the key elements of jury qualifying? Each one of these things can stand on its, law, its own or it can be part of this whole. And we're not, none of this is meant to just be for us as court staff. It's meant to be for judges and judicial officers, hearing examiners, whatever. All of them can benefit from looking at some of these materials and participating in the activities and looking through the resources. And keep in mind, I, I know Janet downplayed her expertise, but she has expertise in many areas, but she called on experts to assist, as well as TJ, who went to the library and so forth. And I did want to acknowledge, you know, we have another Don Palammer, actually, um, also is another one of our writers for the budgeting and fiscal management. And we actually asked um, NASJ, and Margaret Allen is here, she's the president uh, of NASJ, and we re Nakem reached out to them as uh, state judicial educators and we actually had them actually write the educational development curriculum. And getting back to the point of discussing issues with your judges, one of the big issues is the importance of education in the court community. And there are some great resources in that, for example, that can be lifted to share with presiding judges, leading judges on the importance of education. Um, so there's a lot of great resources, a lot of expertise. So we, we, we thank our partners as well well for participating. Absolutely, and that is, um, I may have heard a couple of the questions, that was the only thing I was going to add. Um, there are great materials to start with, but you do have, you do have partners, so in addition to your colleagues at your local court who uh, develop education for your, for your staff at the state level, uh, there are judicial educators who are more than happy to share our resources and expertise. Great. Are there other things you can think of? as to how you could take these back right now and use them. Some things, we've already got scheduled in Michigan. Kathy's been involved in it, and, um, we, but we have an annual court, a, a groups of court associations that come together for a conference, and we're always looking for themes or speakers. Um, what we've decided to do 
do was to use one competency a year mm -hmm. as sort of the general theme. For You've the got a long vision. <laughs> 13 years. <laughs> so we're, we, we, we actually did this for 10 years with the old competencies, and it worked out very, very well. Um, but we're starting off, Jude has agreed as the, the writer for um, purposes and responsibilities to come in and be our keynote speaker um, at our conference this year to try to set the stage, look at you know, what the core is about, and then you know blend the, the other workshops and things um, it, with related topics. That's a great idea. I'm no longer actually employed in a court, but if I were, I would take this full set and I would say at this month's all staff meeting, we're gonna look at the public trust and confidence. Next month, we're gonna look at purposes of courts. Mm -hmm. Next month, we're going to get into whatever. And I would potentially pull out some of these very exercises and have the folks at this staff meeting talk about it. Do some self-evaluation. I mean, you know, there's an infinite possibility as to how this can be used. Any other comments or suggestions? Yes. Just a thought. In, in the state of Utah, you Or to go to trainings. Or, well, they have to, yeah. Other, other than that, but I would. Right. I, I would guess that those trainings are largely focused on the required duties, you know, record keeping, filing, changes in the law. But, you know, this this is talking about the broader management. Take turn it into a webinar and, or a brown bag lunch series yes. that you send a little video to the local court along with an instruction sheet on doing an activity around it or something and. Make it work. When I was in the municipal court, we were struggling for time for staff education, and our staff was under a mandate for required educational credits every year. We decided that on the first Wednesday of every month, we would open the court one half hour later. So instead of 8 a.m., we would open at 8.30. And on that Wednesday of the month, that was time for the operational teams to do their legislative updates, their process, training, uh, they had anywhere from 7.30 to 8.30, and if they worked time beyond their normal shift, we flexed the time out, so no overtime. And on the third Wednesday of the month, likewise, we opened to the court one half hour later, 8.30 instead of 8 a.m. We informed the Supreme Court Administrative Office that this was occurring and got their support. That was the dedicated time once a month for me to have all staff there. Typically, counter staff, money handling staff, security staff, courtroom staff cannot remove themselves from their functions, but that allowed us to do it. This content then could be cycled into different presentations, discussions, maybe assign chunks of this to someone on staff, like Danielle, would you read up on the strategic planning part and be our presenter at next month's Wednesday morning? You know, you can. We're only limited by our creativity as to how we find a way to push out training. Paul, could you talk a little bit about what you're planning to do with the, with the different groups? You're, you're looking at um, having someone develop some slides and a little bit of narrative to go along with each topic. Sure. And what's that, how's that gonna be used? Sure, thank you, Kevin. In addition to the resources that I had mentioned, the website and the, and the guide and the curriculum, um, for those of you that, that might not know, 
Nakam was actually able to do this first off through a grant fund through the State Justice Institute. So we thank them for their uh, funding and their um, you know interest in Nakam actually doing this. So through uh, funding that was made available, we thought that we another great resource would be to develop a does it, is everyone familiar with like articulate that program that you record sort of webinar and you record that you know with the PowerPoint slides and a narrative you know overlay to that um, we decided to take the two competencies in in the um, first the principal module and we're creating a 15 minute recorded uh, articulate a webinar type of training program to discuss what that competency is, why it's important, and how you would use the resources like the curriculum available. So <clears throat> we're trying to provide an added you know, benefit to the members if you wanted to or you're thinking of how are we going to utilize that. We thought those you know, 10 to 15 minute you know, recorded sessions would give a great overview of that particular curriculum, why you would want to go through it, how you might use that in your court. And those will be available probably uh, mid-year, I think, and posted on the NACOM website. So again, another great resource, but we'll just be doing that for the two competencies within the principal module. But we encourage that if any of you all come up and do anything locally on your own, to share it back, we can put it into a resource section on the core site and make it available to others as an example or even something that they may just be able to play locally if they did a training. Yeah, um, we just wanted to reiterate, this was all of this work and the thousands of man hours and reviewers and experts and, and so forth, this was done for all of you, all of us. It wasn't just done, you know, so, so Nakam could check a box. There was a great need for this. So we had, as I had mentioned, uh, back in the 90s, we surveyed the membership. They had asked for materials that they could use in the court. So use this as your own material. Use this as your, your, your own guides. And if it needs update, improving, if you have suggestions, please let us know because we want it to continue this resource to make it valuable to all of you. So NACOM has a commitment to you. And again, please share with us how we can improve it and keep the courts engaged in using it. And we'll be glad to continue, again, to offer this great resource to the court community. And looking back over the last 20 years at all our website statistics, month after month after month, people were going to the core and looking at the company, especially a lot of folks overseas too. So we, we recognize that this is the biggest product, one of the biggest products that NACOM can offer back to you all as the profession to continue to keep it relevant. So we're gonna put it out there and try and make it even more than it was before. Kathy. All right. Well, we thank you all for your participation and engagement, and uh, we hope you, we provided you something practical again. That was the purpose of this, that you could utilize back in your court environment. So thank you very much.